So today I'm joined by Ekaterina Aframova. Double Olympian competing for two different countries. London Olympics 2012 for Bulgaria and at the Rio Olympics 2016 for Turkey. Biggest achievements, European Championship finalist, World Championship semi-finalist. Welcome, Ekaterina. Hello. <laughs> so you're living, you are originally from Bulgaria. You Correct. You compete for Turkey and you live in London. How does Absolutely. that work? Absolutely. You know, many people ask me the question, oh, where are you from? And then I say, this is the most difficult question you can, <laughs> you can ever ask me. So I was, um, I was born in Bulgaria, in Sofia, and then uh, I was 15, 16 when my parents decided to move to London because of my swimming. And down the line in my career, as you mentioned, I uh, started swimming for Turkey. So um, it has been a very interesting journey so far and um, a lot of changes, a lot of uh, people that I met along the way and many lessons that I learned and I'm sure you'll be very interested to hear <laughs> about it. I guess let's start with the first lesson. So what was your darkest moment in your athletic life? Oh, you know, as an athlete, I'm sure we go through a lot of um, hardships, a lot of tough moments, but also some great memories and experiences probably i you know i couldn't choose between the darkest i have um two moments in my career and one was recently um but the first one was in 2008 when i couldn't qualify for um, the beijing olympic games it was my dream as a little girl ever um ever i was since i was 11 years old it was my dream to go to the Olympics. And um, 2008 was my goal, was my first goal. And I couldn't simply because I was coached by a guy who almost made me quit swimming. Mm. Um, he was at the time the national team coach of Bulgaria. Very unfortunately, he's still the same guy <laughs> and still the national team coach. Um, he, his way of coaching was somehow to push you down and to make you feel worthless, thinking that this somehow would bring something out of you. Well, of course, every person is different. It didn't work for me. Um, and that was one of the main reasons why my parents decided to move from Bulgaria to London. I came back, so in 2008, in the um, few months before the Olympics, we had a World Junior Championship in uh, Mexico, Mon Montre. And um, over there, I was going with the idea that I'm, I'm going to be a finalist because the times that I qualified with to go to there were at the top level of the juniors, especially on the 50 meters backstroke. Going over there, he um, completely ignored me for the entire travel. He took away my phone and my computer and every connection that I had with my family and friends. And uh, when I wasn't, I didn't swim very well at that competition. I almost came last on, on most of the events. Um, and when I, I did swim bad, he turned around and said, um, it's my fault. And um, he completely um, just put all the responsibility on me. To which, um, when I got back to Bulgaria, I sat down with my parents and I said, listen, I, I don't want to swim anymore. That's it. If, if he's the guy that I have to... And unfortunately, there is not many swimming pools or coaches that could um, could have then, now a little bit better, but then could have um, actually coached me. So I said to, to my parents, I was like, I'm done. That's it. I don't want to do it anymore. And then it came the tough decision for my mom to sell her business and to just move to London for a better future for me and my sister, which ended up 
changing completely my life and taking me to two Olympic Games, seven world championships, 14 Europeans and so on and so on and meeting the greatest person ever, which is my coach ever since I moved to London. The second darkest moment was this summer going into the world championship in uh, South Korea. I, I can honestly say that I was at the best shape ever, at the best shape that I've ever been. I trained um, extremely hard for um, the last three years, but especially the last 10 months. I spent some time in Canada swimming with new group of people. I traveled a lot. I raced in America for the first time in my career. And all of that brought me into being at the best possible shape for me. Going into our training camp just before flying to South Korea, I got eye infection. Unfortunately, um, it was handled very badly by the doctor that I was um, seen by. He thought it was a viral infection and he gave me antibiotics to um, fight a viral infection. Once um, we got to South Korea, it was my eye was to a point where I couldn't see anymore. It was just all uh, bloated and um, it, it was horrible. And the pain that I experienced through the flight from Istanbul to South Korea, I've never ever had anything like that before. I was literally ready to just say, you know, I'm, I'm not racing. I couldn't even put my goggles on. It was so bad. When we got to South Korea, the doctors over there, thank God, realized that it wasn't a viral, but a bacterial infection. So they gave me another set of antibiotics, which start working for about 48 hours from the, the day I started. So I managed to race. I managed to help my team um, with the relays. But of course, as you all know, once we start taking antibiotics and the moment that we are like tapering and most vulnerable, then um, all the work you've done pretty much is gone. So I didn't perform as good. I was, I was hoping to do the A cut for the Olympics there um, because I was just a second away from it uh, three weeks before we went to um, South Korea. So that was, uh, that was a moment in my career where I thought, you know what, you, you spend so much energy and time and um, you sacrifice so much and you're away from your family. And at the end, something as simple as that could turn everything around and you can lose everything. So don't take anything for granted. That's what I realized out of, out of this. Okay, and then what did you learn from both of these moments in terms of how do you recover from moments like that? What I learned is that uh, so far nothing can uh, touch me, <laughs> you know, like we, we think when, when a bad situation occurs, you think, oh my God, this is the end of the world, nothing, nothing could, uh, could help me. But if you sit back and you think about it, there is a lot worse moments than this. Um, and when I realized it's very, I, I believe for an athlete, it's very difficult to sit back and say, you know what, my health is more important than qualifying for the Olympics. My health is more important because I have another 10 months to work twice as hard and to be able to qualify. If this situation happened on my last possible competition to qualify for Tokyo, I probably I would have thought differently, but because I have all that 10 months ahead of me from today to be able to qualify and to try again, um, almost seven more competitions that I'll be able to do, um, I learned that health and my well-being is better than anything. Um, I think it's the same thing with uh, the first um, bad situation where I had the problem with the coach. Um, it taught me that the connection between an athlete and a coach is the most important one. You have to trust each other. You have to uh, work together. And, you know, not always things come out the way we all want or we trained for or we thought it would. 
um, then you just have to analyze to a point where you sit down and say, okay, that's it. You know, we move on and it's just an experience that you learn from it. Okay, cool. What was your best moment? Oh, that, that, that I'll never, never, never forget. It's when I qualified for my first Olympic Games. Uh, that's what um, <laughs> I think um, 2012, um, we had at the Olympic pool in March 2012, British Swimming organized a championship to try the pool. And also um, it's a pre-Olympic event. So I went there to race with my club. I was close to the qualifying times, but to be honest, you know, it wasn't, it was, it was a goal for us, but it wasn't at any price. It was like, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, you know, it's, I was just little, I was 21 at that point. Um, and I think that was the way, that was why actually it happened so easy because I was just relaxed and I did what I did my job. I did what my coach said I have to do, and I did what I've trained for. Um, I swam the 100, and on the 100, I was 0 0.5 away from the A cut. And I always thought, you know, 100, I, I thought the 100 was my main event. Unfortunately, through the years, I start realizing that the 200 is my main event, as much as I don't like that. <laughs> um, so the next day I was swimming the 200 and in the morning I swam all right, about two seconds away from the A cut, but it was very close to my best time. So I was happy. And in the evening at the final, um, I just raced. I raced the people around me and I swam to 10.4, which was uh, the moment I touched the wall and I saw the time, I started crying. I couldn't stop crying because I realized I'm going to my first Olympic Games. And as I was walking back to the tribunes where um, the seats, the team seats where my team and coach um, were sitting, I picked up the phone and I called the coach from Bulgaria, which told me that I would never be an Olympian and that I would never, ever make it to the big swimming. I called him and I said, you know what? I just qualified for my Olympics and you were wrong. And I shut the phone and then I, I mean, the whole evening was just um, unforgettable. I cried and I laughed and I smiled. Um, that, was, that was the best moment ever. Okay. And if you reflect on the qualification for London and the qualification for Beijing, you said in London you were much more relaxed. Is it something, what if, of course, but if you, in retrospect, if you would have been more... Do you think you could have been more relaxed in the other one and made it? I don't think so. So in, uh, for, for Beijing, I was very, very young, as I said. Um, the, training, the trainings that I was doing in Bulgaria were just completely wrong. And I wasn't fast enough. It was just Beijing was a dream that I wished I could. Um, London was a reality that I knew I would as long as I do everything correctly. The four years difference, I trained um, a, lot, a lot more, a lot better, and uh, with a coach that I, I simply love. It's, it's just a, a connection that you, you, as long as you have a person next to you like this, you understand what it means because um, he's just incredible. He is amazing. And I think if it wasn't for him and the way he made me realize that I have the potential to do it, I wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't be swimming anymore and I wouldn't be getting to um, the competitions that I've already done. If you could go back in time 10, 15 years, what advice would you give a younger Ekaterina? 10, 15 years, if I was going back, I would say uh, move to London earlier or move away from Bulgaria earlier. Uh, believe in yourself and uh, that she needs to be tough because in front of her are a lot of obstacles that um, will come, but she shouldn't be scared to just face them and go and everything will be better. And move to London refers to just 
getting to a different training location or is it also getting out of your own country and the culture and your network? I think getting out from Bulgaria in general. Okay. Why is that? And unfortunately, Bulgaria is a lovely country um, in terms of nature and history. Um, it, it, it's amazing. And I love going back there to see my friends and my family, which I still have. But the infrastructure of sport, health, education, unfortunately, is getting worse and worse um, every year. The sport doesn't have enough money to support their athletes and um, all the facilities. Um, we have only few very good pools in the whole country. Um, and it's very, it, it's quite difficult to um, train the way you should there. And of course, the support is not, it's not great compared to um, other countries with probably the same amount of talented um, kids because Bulgaria is full of talented athletes, not just swimming. Um, but the lack of resources make us choose to go out of the country. Hmm. And I've seen or read in an interview You were inspired by the only Olympic gold medalist from Bulgaria to take up swimming. For two, two questions. Who was it? And you also said she outlined her ups and downs. What did she outline or he? I don't really know. Um, so the only gold, Bulgarian gold medalist, it's uh, Tanya Bogomilova. And she swam 100 breaststroke in the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, Korea. <laughs> And um, she won the gold medal and um, she was giving, I was a little girl and I was watching an interview with her and she was giving an interview saying um, about all the injuries she was going through and uh, the, the different um, hardships she had to battle. And I was just listening to the whole, to the whole story, you know, of her first competition, of the Olympics, of how she went there, how um, she was pregnant, and um, all of this, and how she just, she went through it. No matter what, it came in front of her, she just went through it. Later, through the years, I had um, the great pleasure to work with her because she was our boss. <laughs> she was the Federation uh, president until uh, recently when she resigned and somebody else took over her place. Um, even though I left Bulgaria and I changed to swim for another country, we still um, respect each other because we had um, a good connection. And uh, we still talk to each other from time to time. And she, I, I hope she understood the reasons why I changed. And it's not because I don't like Bulgaria or I don't feel uh, Bulgarian. It's just because I have better opportunities to, um, to work in a better environment swimming for Turkey. Okay, interesting. What are the habits that make you a successful person or athlete? I believe um, determination is one of them. Uh, you have to be determined. You have to be hardworking. Um, you need to be disciplined. This is one of the, the top um, reasons. And um, you have to be able to dream because when you dream, most of the times the dreams come true. <laughs> I guess you have to put some work in as well. Oh, the work is, it, of course, nothing comes by sitting and watching TV at home. <laughs> I just mentioned that because there's this book, um, uh, what is it? The Secret, which kind of goes about, you know, think about it and it, it will come. <laughs> I think it uh, misguides a little bit. That, uh, a little bit, perhaps, yeah. yes. You have to think about it, dream about it, believe in it and work for it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I also read... And I misquote you here maybe a little bit. Because of the sport, I grew up learning to be determined, never take shortcuts and to dream because dreams can come true when you put in the effort. Can you elaborate on that? Not so much the dream, but about the sport and um, that you can't take shortcuts and so on. I believe that, I, I truly believe that sport should be clean and that we all have to um, do our best 
Of course, uh, recently, in the last few years, we've had a lot of um, doping scandals. And um, to be honest, to be completely honest with you, every time I give um, doping uh, sample, I'm worried. I'm worried not because I've taken something. I'm worried because nowadays you don't know what you eat. You don't know what um, you've taken with uh, your normal uh, protein shake or your normal supplement, vitamin supplements. Um, it says something on the label. You believe, you, you, you check everything. And at the end, simple things like the meat that I ate in China or Turkey or London could have been contaminated and gave a positive test. And then the whole world of an athlete just falls apart. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking to the people that actually know that they've been wrong and took the things that they're not supposed to. But for me, the shortcuts are, uh, the shortcuts are that. You're not supposed to cheat in training. So in, uh, in Bulgaria, I remember when I was little, we used to receive our training session and we go, okay, it says 800, we can do 600. He's not going to realize. It says 1,000, we can do 800. He's not going to realize. But actually, the coach sees everything. That he lets you off some things doesn't mean he doesn't know. Through the years, and especially when I came uh, to London, I um, learned that it's for my benefit. If I cheat in training and I don't do what it's supposed to be done, it will only have impact on me. So, uh, so that taught me how to just do, of course, think of what I'm doing. And some, uh, sometimes we challenge, um, my coach and I have challenges because I say, well, why, why am I doing this? And then he explains to me. And then if I still d disagree with him, I would just say it. And then somewhere in the middle, we'll find um, a middle point and we'll just carry on. Um, but yes, the hard work and the shortcuts, uh, they, don't, they don't go together. Okay. And I also believe swimming is a very tough sport because you're just by yourself and just swimming up and down, right? Oh, you know, if, if somebody, many times I say I chose the wrong sport <laughs> because um, for the amount of time that we put into swimming and training and the amount of time that we actually race, uh, we, we spend probably 98% of the time training and 2% of the time racing. And um, for that one minute or two minutes that we race, we train with hours and kilometers. And I mean, my season is 11 months long um, and it has been for the last 20 years. Mm. I don't feel tired yet, but one day when I decide that enough is enough, it will be the day that I retire. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So... That brings me to the next one. Um, I used to study in my early days in Berlin, and there also were quite a lot of high-profile swimmers. And I remember my university some days started at eight in the morning, and I was dragging myself to 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 the lectures. But then you pass by the swimming pool, and the swimmers have finished their first session. So. Um, the question is, what's your morning routine? Because I know swimmers have early mornings. Oh, yes. So uh, most of the mornings I wake up at 4.30 and I'm at the pool by 5.15. At 5.20, we jump in the water. We swim sometimes until 7, sometimes until 8, sometimes until 8.30. Depends on the session, depends on uh, the time of the year. In the winter, normally um, we swim longer at the beginning because it's the beginning of the season and you have to build up um, the capacity of everything um, and also the the kilometers then i after swimming i go up to the gym i do either dry land or gym session which is weights i do stretching afterwards for sure this is one of the things that i learned the hard way when i had an injury and um, after that, I come home. It's probably 10.30, sometimes 11 o'clock. I have breakfast, which is between breakfast and lunch. <laughs> and then I go to sleep. I am extremely lucky to be able to have about four, sometimes five hours of sleep during the day. 
And in the afternoon, my training session starts at 6 p.m. So I go at the pool around half past five to do a little bit of mobility. And um, I swim from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. After that, I go back home, I have dinner, and I'm in bed by 10 p.m. because the next morning, we start again. So if you count it together, you get enough sleep at least. Yes, with the morning, with the, with the during the day sleep, I do, I think I do get enough sleep. Thank you.